In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. The Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of Daniel. You may remember that we've been going through a series on the book of Daniel. And specifically what's happening now is Daniel has kind of closed up its narrative to a degree. And now it's moving into the prophecy that takes place later on. But it's important to remember here that it's not chronologically later. See, that's something that we have to bring up to really fully grasp what's going on. In fact, we do have a date. We do have a way to know when this prophecy is taking place, not the result of the prophecy, just when Daniel gets this vision. Because we know that actually happened in the first year of Belshazzar. So you may remember in the narrative of Daniel, we've already gone through the lion's den, which happens after that because the Medes and the Persians have come and taken over the Babylonian Empire. But this vision, when it comes to Daniel, that hasn't happened yet. This is in the first year of Belshazzar reigning in the place of his father, King Nebuchadnezzar. And so the book of Daniel isn't in perfect chronological order. It's more divided up into the narrative section and then to the prophecy section. But parts of the prophecy section were actually revealed to Daniel before the narrative section actually ends. And so you've got the stories and the prophecy, but the revelation didn't necessarily happen in that order. So in this prophecy, Daniel sees this vision of four beasts coming out of the sea, a winged lion, a bear, which happens to have three ribs in its mouth, and a winged leopard, which has four heads, and a dreadful beast. And it doesn't give a lot of description on what the dreadful beast actually is. It just says that it's a dreadful beast and gives some of the description of its physical characteristics, but doesn't say what kind of animal it really is. And then, of course, we have the Ancient of Days appearing, and we have the verse that we looked at yesterday talking about the coming of the Son of Man, the coming of the kingdom, and a kingdom that will last forever and will be established. So let's go ahead and look at this next section of scripture here. Now that we have that background, this comes from Daniel chapter 7, verses 17 through 18. These great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will arise from the earth. But the saints of the Holy One will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. So now that we have an understanding of what this prophecy actually means, what the author intended for us to get out of it. We have the interpretation of what these dreams is, is supposed to represent. And it's pretty obvious, especially with the hindsight of the New Testament, to understand what's happening in verse 18, where the highest one receives the kingdom and possesses the kingdom forever. So, and we understand this also a little bit from the verses coming out, this is the kingdom of God which comes in Christ. Christ comes to the earth. He establishes the church, his spiritual kingdom present here on earth. That's what Daniel is talking about with the final kingdom. But you'll notice that there is a sharp distinction between that kingdom, a kingdom of heaven, and the four beasts. The four beasts are similar to one another. This kingdom is very different in the same sense that earthly kingdoms are very different from the spiritual kingdom of heaven. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about the earthly kingdoms. And if you understand your history, this has a lot more meaning. First of all, the winged lion, which is the first one to come, that's Babylon. And if you know anything about Babylonian art, a winged lion was commonly the, the animal that was associated with Babylon. This is something that really shouldn't be surprising to us. Most nations have some kind of animal that they really like to depict in their art, and the animal kind of becomes synonymous with the, the nation itself. For example, in Egypt, that animal was typically uh, a falcon because their god was Ra, and that's what they worshipped. And so if you see a bird, especially a bird with the sun behind it, because Ra is a sun god, 
then that's typically a symbol of Egypt. You know that that is something that was usually used to depict Egypt. And this happens all throughout history. We even see it now. England typically associates itself with a lion. If you see a lot of the, the royals being depicted, some of the flags that you'll see throughout British culture, they depict lions. America has the eagle. Whenever you see a bald eagle, you think about America. You associate that animal with it. That's what happened with winged lions. Winged lions were kind of seen as the symbol of Babylon. And so it's not surprising that God would use the winged lion when trying to convey a truth to David, or sorry, to, to convey a truth to Daniel, to use a winged lion to describe that. And it also makes sense that it's the first one, because remember Daniel's frame of reference. Daniel is living in Babylon before it's overthrown by the Medes and the Persians. We saw in the last chapter, no, the chapter before that, we saw in Daniel 5 that the Medes and the Persians take over the Babylonian Empire from King Belshazzar, but that hasn't happened yet. In this part of the narrative, in this part of the story, this vision actually comes to him many years before that takes place. And so here we have the winged lion Babylon being the first creature that Daniel sees come out of the sea because that's where he is right now. So that's actually the present. Then you have the next animal, the bear with the ribs in its teeth. That is representative of Persia. Now, Persia isn't symbolic of the bear in any way like we see the winged lion in Babylon. But one thing that is interesting to note is that it has three ribs in its mouth. And if you understand how the Persians took over Babylon, this becomes very significant. Because what essentially happened with Persia is that it kind of proxied the entire Babylonian Empire. It did take over, and there were some battles and skirmishes here and there, but it kind of just destroyed the central, uh, the central pillar of the Babylonian Empire and then propped everything back up in its own place. It conquered the entire empire, which is usually not the way things happen. Usually what you'll see is when a empire or another world power takes over, it slowly takes over other providences. And there was some part of that taking place within the struggle between the Persians and the Babylonians, but by and large what happened is Persia came in, took over the central capital of Babylon, and then the entire Babylonian capital in a very short amount of time became under Persian rule, and then the rest of the empire was also ruled by the Persians. And so you'll notice that the Babylonian Empire and the Persian Empire look almost exactly the same because they basically co-opted the Babylonian Empire. So these ribs in its mouth, the remains of Babylon, have been taken up in the jaws of the Persian Empire. So that's really where that symbolism comes in. And then you have the winged leopard with four heads. After the fall of Babylon, and then after the fall of the Persians, who came in next? The Greeks. Alexander the Great conquered most of the known world, and it's actually in the, the central city of Babylon that Alexander the Great dies, because that's the last, the last place that he really conquers and establishes himself and takes over what remained of the Persian Empire. And what happened after that? Well, Alexander the Great's... Um, empire was mostly divvied up by his generals. Remember, Alexander the Great died at a very young age, and seemingly pretty unexpectedly. And so, the fact that he actually happens to be in the seat of power there in Babylon, when he passes away, and his generals have to take over the, the entire thing, remember that a head directs the body. And so, you, here you have the Grecian Empire that is led not by one person, not by one head, but several generals that were there with Alexander the Great. So this winged leopard with four heads is symbolic of Greece because it's an animal that keeps trying to go in different directions even though it's a great empire because it has different heads trying to direct the direction of the leopard. And then finally, there's the dreadful beast. And the Bible specifically describes this as a beast unlike the others because this is an empire unlike the others. And we've seen in the verse that we just read in Daniel 7:17 7, that these beasts represent different kings and different kingdoms. Well, Rome is the final empire, and the Bible specifically describes it as one that will 
take up the entire Earth. Rome had conquered pretty much the entire known world at the time. I mean, its empire went from, of course, Italy, where it all started, and went as far up as the British Isles, went very far into the east. There were regions of the east that were actually worshipping Caesar as a god. And so, the empire was incredibly expansive. And we'll get into the symbolism later about some of the horns, but this is the reason that a lot of the skeptics of the Bible try to drum up this story that the book of Daniel was written much later than it was, or at the very least, the latter part of Daniel's story was written way after the time of Christ. You see, the reason that they propose this is because everything fits so well. Everything fits so perfectly that there are only two possible explanations. Either this was written after the fact, it was written after all these events took place because there's no way an account this perfect could have taken place beforehand. Or the person that was writing this knew the future. The person that was writing this knew the future because Daniel understood based on the vision that God had given him because God knew the future. He conveyed that truth to Daniel. This is how we know that Daniel is a prophet and this is the way that God instructs other people to know who the prophet is, if their prophecies pan out. Those scholars that try to skeptically say, no, no, that was written afterward, they can't explain away how everything fits perfectly. And so the only thing that they can come up with is they use circular logic. They say, well, it couldn't have possibly be written before all these events took place because nobody can tell the future. You see, they eliminate the possibility of a miracle by saying, but miracles don't exist. It would be like you bringing in an elephant and me saying, that's not an elephant. And you say, well, how do you know it's not an elephant? I say, because elephants don't exist. You see, if I already don't believe in elements, uh, in, in elephants, even showing me something, if I refuse to believe it and close my mind, even showing me evidence to the contrary will not allow me to say, yep, you're right, there are such things as elephants. Because if I've already determined, nope, elephants don't exist, doesn't matter what you do to me, doesn't matter what you show me, doesn't matter what evidence I see, I'm going to assume that elephants don't exist. Well, then, of course, when you show me one, I'm going to say, nope, not a real elephant. Because to me, I've already made the determination in my heart that no matter what you show me, I'm not going to accept it. This is the reason that you see skeptics of the book of Daniel. They've already assumed that Daniel could not have possibly known this ahead of time, but all the details are way too perfect for them to say, nope, it's, it's mere coincidence. So they do the only thing that they have left, which is to say that, no, somebody else must have written that and claimed to be Daniel way, way later. But all of the history, all of the history we have backing the book of Daniel shows it was written when it was claimed to be, that it would have had to have been written before about 523 BC. That's the only explanation here. And the reason that they choose to be skeptical of this, the reason that they choose to say, no, it had to have been written at a different time is because they can't accept that God is Israel. They can't accept that God already knew what was going to happen. He already knew what was going to play out on the world stage when it came to humanity. And he gave Daniel a look, a preview at what was going to happen. So they try to retroactively claim this, but we have manuscripts that backs this up. The part of Daniel that we're talking about that takes place in the latter chapters, that is included in manuscripts that predate this, that, that it would have gone along with it. We don't have the manuscripts from that far back because they wouldn't have been preserved. But there is no reason to believe that all of these things were added much later. There's no reason to believe that other than you try to assume that God is not real and Daniel couldn't have possibly known these things. Therefore, you arrive at the conclusion that you already decided to arrive at before you even started the journey. It really is a very, very powerful evidence that God is absolutely who he says that he is and that his prophets were able to tell the future because of visions that he sent them. It is a powerful case for your faith. Stay the course, friends. Hey, to make sure you get all the updates, you need to go ahead and subscribe and click that little notification bell down there. 
That gets you a notification every time I post a new Bible lesson or political commentary. Now, I'm not saying that if you don't subscribe, it's because you hate America and Jesus. But I can't think of any other reason you wouldn't subscribe.